this side up here, I'm going to draw an offset curve in. And then this is where I'm going to overlap the four. So like that. And I'll do the exact same one at the bottom, okay, but shorter. And then I'll do another overlap here, curve in the opposite direction. And then the front of the foot, I'm going to start to taper outwards a little bit. And I'll round out the bottom just like that. And then just like I did back here, I'm going to do another curve down and up towards the front of the toe. Okay. today at your direction we hosted a video and telephone conference call with 53 governors uh, as the president said many times we're all in this together and today's meeting uh, is a reflection of the fact that this president understands that industry is a part of the one team in America that's going to address the coronavirus in this country and I'm grateful for these leaders of the nation's top pharmaceutical companies to come in to speak to us about the development of vaccines but also the development of therapeutic medications that uh, uh, can be available in the short term and uh, we're grateful for your participation uh, the president does, uh, will also be uh, traveling tomorrow to the national institute of health cdc before the week is out uh, and we will be meeting uh, with leaders of the airline industry we'll be meeting with with leaders of uh, the cruise line industry uh, and we welcome the partnership with industry in this country as we as we work out the president's top priority uh, which is the health and safety and well-being of the american people and let me also mr president uh extend my welcome to uh dr deborah barks are about 90 percent of our flu product and we can do this without jeopardizing our flu vaccine production importantly because we know that's very important to maintain that so mr president we're willing to do whatever it takes to work with you in this administration the collaboration we've had with NIH and with BARDA, who's co-sponsored our research, to make sure that we do what we can to help with this problem. When do you think you could have the vaccine? When do you think you'd be able to have it start producing it? We're producing it now, an experimental lot. Uh, proteins take somewhat longer than some of the other technologies more exploratory, but it's a, pro it's a technology that works. We think we can be ready for the clinic in a year. And depending upon the nature of how the epidemic goes or doesn't go, uh, you know, uh, we would, and with the help of the agencies of this country, uh, you know, perhaps as few as several years, difficult to predict, Mr. President, knowing that a vaccine has to be both safe and efficacious because it's given to healthy people. Thank you very much. Lenny? Thanks, Mr. President, for having us. Uh, I'm Len Schleifer, the founder and CEO of Regeneron, a company uh, that I built with George Akopoulos over the last uh, 30 years. Um, and we are a, a monoclonal antibody primarily centered uh, company. We are no strangers to collaborating with the administration, Secretary Azar's group, Barter, and we came up with a cure for Ebola. Um, and we're very proud of that. Uh, Dr. Fauci's group was really instrumental in testing that under unbelievable conditions in the Congo. Um, and it didn't create quite as much excitement because thank goodness it didn't hit our shores. But we can use the exact same technology and we already have. We have a thousand antibodies uh, that are already sitting in dishes. We're screening them, we're selecting them. We anticipate if all goes well, 200,000 doses per month can come out of our factory in New York uh, starting in August. Uh, the unique thing about our technology- That means you'd be able to use the vaccine that early? Depends on what uh, we see, uh, how we work closely with the FDA, uh, which we'll, we will do. The FDA has already reached out to us, but we've got to work closely. So that process would be faster than John's? It would be. Um, the, Can you explain why that would be? Well, so we make um, passive uh, vex, uh, vaccine and therapeutic, therapeutic. Our drug will be able to protect you. Whether or not you're infected, it'll protect you from getting infected, or if you are infected, it would treat you. And the we have just taken processes that normally take years, literally years, and we put them end to end and now do them in weeks to months that nobody else in the industry can do. So we're very excited to collaborate once again. So this would be a combination of a vaccine and also it will, put it in a different way, make you better 
quicker. You will think of it this way. If you, if you get immunized with one of these vaccines, you're going to make some antibodies to protect you. We're going to already make those antibodies and give them to you so you don't have to go through that whole process. So it'll protect you. And as we showed with Ebola, you give enough of them, we, it was life-saving, life, uh, truly life-saving. It beat out the antivirals. It really it was the way to go. It's very predictable. I just want to say I hope everybody succeeds here. I mean, this is bringing everybody together here is really critical. And there's going to be success. This industry is really talented. Uh, as an industry, sometimes we run astray, but we're going to get this done. Thank you very much. Thanks. I appreciate it. Please. Thank you, Mr. Of invitation. Stefan Dorsel, I'm the CEO of Moderna. So, the Moderna team in Massachusetts is very proud uh, to be uh, working with the U.S. government and to have already sent in only 42 days from the sequence of a virus or vaccine to uh, Dr. Fauci's team at the NIH. We're now waiting for the vaccine to be green light from the FDA so that the team can start dosing uh, as soon as possible. What is very interesting about our technology is that we use messenger RNA. So basically it's an information molecule that allows to go very quickly from the genetic information of a virus to having a vaccine. So we have already have nine vaccines in the clinic, uh, in the US, in Germany, and in Australia. We have five of those for uh, respiratory diseases. We've already partnered with DARPA uh, from Department of Defense, with BARDA from HHS. We're having ongoing discussions. We were able to go so fast because we were working for many years with the NIH and we had worked with uh, Dr. Sparsi's team on the MERS uh, vaccine for the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, which is a coronavirus. And so we were able to move very, very fast uh, from a few phone calls to getting a vaccine made uh, ready for the clinic. We are now working on the phase two material so that as soon as we get the phase one dose out of the NIH, we'll be able to start the phase two right away. So we're hoping to get the, the phase one start very soon now. We're just waiting for a green light. The product is at the NIH. And then it will be a few months to get the human data that will allow us to pick a therapeutic dose to start the phase two right away. So you're talking over the next few months, you think you Correct. could have a vaccine? Correct. Mm -hmm. uh, with phase two. Yeah. You would have a vaccine. You'll have a vaccine to go into testing. Yes. <laughs> and how long would that take? The phase two will take a few months before we can go into phase three. Oh, so you're talking within a, a year. Like I've been telling you, yeah, yeah. Like, well, a year to a year. Lenny is talking about two months. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and, we would, and we would be there in June. We, would, we will be there in June. In, phase in a couple of months. Yeah. I mean, I like the sound of a couple of months better. <laughs> but when, yeah. when you say June phase one initiation, though, right? In June? Yeah. Not a completed vaccine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, your vaccine never be ready for testing in phase one. Uh, uh, ready, to use, ready to use when, would you say? Ready to use in front of the public. I think for the next season. So assuming that the vaccine is well tolerated and safe and efficacious, as John said, um, then I think the question is how do we work with the FDA to expedite that as fast as possible through some sort of fast track program to get it through phase two and three testing to get to oh, quick. Right. So as quickly as possible. What do you say to that, Lenny? Look. I, I sense the cautiousness of uh, Dr. Fauci, and he's right to be cautious, because vaccines have to be tested because there's precedent for vaccines to actually make diseases worse. And you really don't want to make it, you don't want to rush and treat a million people and find out you're making 900,000 of them worse. So, yeah, so that's why I think why Dr. Fauci is being a little bit cautious. I don't want to speak for him, but so we need to prove that. You know, I think that with our technology, by knowing that we have neutralizing antibodies that we give, we know that this approach worked for Ebola, we know that it worked for MERS and animals, we have a greater degree of confidence um, that this would work uh, sooner, I think. But, okay, that's good. The way it is. Thank you very much. Daniel? Yeah, Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, thank you for having us here. So I'm going to switch it up a little bit. We're not a vaccine company. We're a therapeutic company Good. focused on antivirals. Let's, let's talk about and, that. And uh, Gilead Sciences, I know, has worked with a lot of people around the table here. Let me first take the opportunity to thank you for the efforts of the administration, the secretary on the uh, HIV elimination program, which we're closely connected incredible. with. Uh, I mean, yeah. the, HIV, incredible. to be able to prevent and treat this disease is just extraordinary. So we're so. saying 10 years, but now we're into nine years. Could have been started earlier, and somebody else didn't start it early, but we started it right away. Uh, and I'm now saying, I started off saying 10 years, now I'm down to nine years. Do you think by the end of nine years, uh, HIV is where? 
I don't think it eliminated in the developed can world. You I mean, we'll be eliminated in because we have the ability to prevent it now, and That's if you can get to point. the people to really prevent it and then treat everybody, I think it's, a, it's, it's certainly something back, we're fully committed to. If you remember back ten years ago, how horrible that was, and a little beyond the ten years, and now uh, to, to think uh, about what you've done, what what's happened. So yeah, Daniel, absolutely. let's so talk about that same antiviral experience that Gilead has had decades to now to apply it to coronavirus. So we have a medicine called remdesivir which is like a decade-long development that's, a, that's an antiviral used to treat uh, coronaviruses, the same viruses that, uh, the same family of SARS and MERS, and we're hoping it has effect now against uh, COVID-19. So we know in vitro that it has very high effect. So you have a medicine that's already involved with the coronaviruses, yeah. and now you have to see if it specifically for this. When they... Correct. You can know that tomorrow. Okay. So well, we have we now, now the critical thing is to do clinical trials, and oh, we're right. in the we're in the process. We have two clinical trials going on in China that were started uh, several weeks ago. There are uh, 400 patient trials each. Uh, they're getting close to halfway enrolled or enrolling very quickly. Yet? Well, we don't know because they're double blind randomized trials. So we have to wait till the conclusion of the trial. We expect to get that information in April. Then we've been working with uh, Tony and the group at NIH to have another protocol, uh, an NAID, that will also be a protocol that we'll use in China, outside of China, here in the United States, to, to test for the virus. And we have two other uh, clinical trials that we're going to initiate next week by Anything Gilead. Here? Anything here? Uh, yes, yes. Well, the NIAID trial already had its first patients in Nebraska. Uh, and I think, Tony, we're working on getting to Washington, Washington State now. Right. When you go to Washington State, where it seems to have Absolutely. problems. So the intention is to, to begin re re recruiting patients there in the coming days. Yeah, right. Because the trial is really ready to go. So we're, we're fully Did dedicated. You go to specifically the nursing home where they had an yes. outbreak? Yes, and the community, of course, that that touches because all the healthcare workers and that, the family members that have. When you, when Will that take place? So literally, literally, I think, Tony, I think it's the next couple of days. We'll couple of days. If Tony's so involved, it'll be tomorrow morning. Yeah, that's it. That's it. But this is a collaboration. You know, we worked on the protocol together, obviously, for providing the investigational medicine. We're working hand in glove with many people around the table to make sure that whether it's FDA or CDC or So when will NIH. you know if it works? I mean, you already have this medicine. Well, when I think know? we'll know in the April time frame. And, uh, yep. and, and, do you and know, do you all, if you're able to say, do you have any negative kickouts, kickouts like futility, futility analyses or DSMB reviews? There is a DSMB or, review, and the in the trial in China, they probably take a look at some of that data in March. Okay. So far, there's that would be only stopped though for yeah. safety reasons. Oh, okay. You really have to wait to the end of the trial to see efficacy. So we're moving as fast as we can. I think everybody around the table is moving as fast as we can. And, and on top of that, of course, we have to anticipate success. So we're significant investing in the manufacturing facility and capacity. We've been working closely with the administration to make You've sure we built the facility to manufacture. We have facilities that we're repurposing for the coronavirus. This would be tremendous other. news if that works. Yes, yeah, because terrific. you're there. Right. I mean, you're there. You have the plant. You have everything ready. We have a trial in severe patients and in more moderate patients. And we're trying to understand, as we all are, with the epidemiology of this disease, where, where, where and when is the best place to treat. It's very so exciting. Get it it's done, exciting. Daniel. We're on. Don't disappoint us, Dan. You understand right that? Thank you. Great company. Really thank great company. Thanks thank for your support. You. Doctor, perhaps you'd like to say a few words? Yeah, thank, thank you, Mr. President, Mr. Mr. Vice President. Um, it's really an honor to be here with you. I'm really vaccines uh, for the benefit of the American people. And um, we, of course, want them to be safe and efficacious, but really look forward to, to working with you on this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this year, and as soon as possible, I can hear your uh, encouragement to all of us. Um, I, I wanted also to say that uh, Pfizer has uh, 30 three zero R and D manufacturing sites in the U.S. More than 30,000 Americans involved in making or discovering medicines, and we're willing to share our experience, our capabilities as a team here to make sure that the public in America gets the best solutions. So do you expect to be dealing with each other a little bit, your competitors, but in this case it's different. Uh, this is something we want to get done very quickly. Do you expect to be sharing your own capabilities with Pfizer and everybody else? Absolutely. Good. I, I think the call of action that can come from you makes all of us feel that we should be one team here. I agree. And we would appreciate that. And as a closing remark, we've had a tremendous partnership with NIH and NIAD, 
in many areas been pioneering to bring medicine or advances forward with CDC dialogues and with FDA here. So for us to we look forward to extend this relationship to make sure that uh, Americans can as fast as possible given your um, encouragement to us and with um, have different options to protect them. Protection is by vaccines to um, deal with those that are exposed, we need treatments, and those that are ill, we need treatments. So it's not just one solution. I think from this team, we should offer uh, multiple approaches, therapeutic and vaccines. Do you see that happening? Because I notice you have a few different variants of what we're talking about. Do you see that happening where maybe there are different, either therapeutics or vaccines, or both, uh, where you use combinations of each, I, maybe I in different areas? You are right on the frontier of science. Uh, it is about combination, and even looking at our colleagues uh, here at Gilead, we have learned that if you have two different mechanisms and put them together as treatment, the likelihood of curing or very long-lasting responses is higher, and we actually work on complementary mechanisms. It's been, it's, been, it's, been, it's been the story of HIV. I love, yeah, I love the, the complementary. If you can do that, I love the complementary. You can count on our commitment. Yeah. yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. It's really very exciting. Please. Mr. President, uh, Mr. Vice President, uh, my name is Joseph Kim. I run a company called Innovio Pharmaceuticals out of Pennsylvania. We're platform to COVID-19. Uh, by getting the just the DNA sequence of the virus, we're able to fully construct our vaccine within three hours. And we've been working on preclinical uh, and, and uh, preparation work uh, with the help of the FDA and acceleration and, and really working very well together. Uh, our plan is to start the U.S.-based clinical trials for COVID-19 vaccine in April of this year, followed by shortly thereafter uh, a trial in China and South Korea. There are a lot more infections in those areas. Um, we can give you an area too. <laughs> no, we can. I mean, you take, uh, you take a look at Seattle again. We can give you an area. So, if you don't mind. Uh, we've been collaborating with uh, uh, U.S. agencies like DARPA, NIH. We collaborated with Dr. Burks uh, in HIV vaccines and many, many years ago. Um, uh, with existing uh, resources and capacity, by end of this year, uh, Innovio could deliver about 1 million doses, but to scale by, uh, by end of this year, but to scale beyond that, we need your help, Mr. President. We need to work with you and your agencies, BARDA and others, uh, to help us scale our vaccine uh, to manufacture in America, to protect the American public, uh, also to lead the world in vaccine development from America. Thank you very much. Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, um, I'm Paul Stoffels, I'm Vice Chairman and Chief Scientific Officer, Officer for Johnson & Johnson. Manufacturing safety, preclinical safety, have to work closely together with the FDA on that. Uh, before the year end, uh, hopefully in November, we have the first clinical data starting and early next year the results of that. And at the same time, we're looking for significant quantity of vaccines being, uh, being already produced uh, in that time frame. Uh, but you can't do anything else than at the moment starting parallel um, the biological clinical work and parallel doing the upscaling uh, and let's see where, where we end as fast as possible. So you have different concepts and methods then, you, you know, Pfizer and Johnson & Johnson, all the great yeah. companies. Are, are you having different, some seem to be faster than others and others, they, they do seem to be different. Uh, concepts. The, the difference in the concept is that we are using a cold virus, an adeno vector, which, which that is a place where you can place a piece of corona, Ebola, or HIV. So we trick the body with another virus and generate the, and the, generate the antibodies it's like that. Different from the others. Different from the others. The difference is also it's been used for many years now. It has been proven for many years that you can do it like that. And we also have a validated upscaling platform which can produce millions of doses in a very short time frame. And that's a parallel process where we developed a cell line 
which if we follow uh, what we could do with Ebola, we could produce like uh, up to hundreds of millions of vaccines in a, in a small, let's say re reasonably small facility for manufacturing. So can you have it ready for next season, any of you? I mean, would you say for That's next cool. season? The next season it should be ready. Yeah. But many people said we have to be we have to be very careful here if you vaccinate several hundred million people. Yeah, make sure it works. It works and safe. Does yeah. It, does it hurt? Yeah, does it hurt? I agree. I agree. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh just um Ann shook it from the C D C and really appreciate the chance to hear everyone. Thank you. Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, thank you for saving the most exciting company for the last. <laughs> so we're Novavax, we're down the street in Maryland. We're a vaccine company, we make recombinant nanoparticles. We make respiratory vaccines. We have two in phase three trials. We have uh, an RSV vaccine where we vaccinated 4,600 4, pregnant women to protect the infants from RSV disease and, and uh, the youngest uh, kids. We have our uh, flu vaccine. We all know we need a better flu vaccine, and we have one in phase three trials. We're going to unblind in four weeks. Exciting time for the company. But we actually uh, are a company that's focused on emerging infectious diseases. We've made two coronavirus vaccines. We've made one for SARS. we made one for MERS. We tested MERS and all the way through animal challenge trials and showed 100% protection. Uh, protection. We have an Ebola vaccine that, that uh, primate studies that we had 100% protection. At, at extremely low doses, and uh, we've made a pandemic flu vaccine for H7 and 9 and others, and, and we've twice now taken from the gene sequence to the first in human studies, done them in 90 days, and published it in the New England Journal, and we're once again doing the same thing since the gene sequence was, was uh, uh, identified, I think, published on January 10th. We've taken our same recombinant nanoparticle platform and uh, have been in animal studies for a couple of weeks. We expect data this week on from one of them. On corona. And on this, I'm sorry, on corona, yes. And, and uh, we're going into non-human primates this week with the coronavirus uh, vaccine candidate. So, so what do you think in terms of timing? What do you think? I mean, this, this, what you hear around the table is, is we can get into humans in the uh, May-June timetable and uh, in a phase one study and, and uh, with also, but we'll have primate data. So those are before. alternative speeds, I think, right? pretty much. We'll, we'll make it very easy for you, but those are, and we have to be very safe, but those are unheard of speeds. No, and, and, and we're trying to identify um, uh, scale so that we can get to the billion, billion unit scale, both where we have a vaccine antigen. Media, would you like to ask any questions of any of the geniuses around the What economic stimulus measures are you considering to boost the economy as a result of the virus? Well, I guess the market's up today. Our country is very strong economically, as you know. Uh, this was a uh, something that came out of China that was a big surprise to the world. It happened just a few weeks ago, and uh, uh, I, I'm sure the Fed is looking at it. I hope the Fed is looking at it. They should be, but a lot of the central banks are looking at it it for stimulus. And one thing I want to add, uh, we keep talking about for America, but really we're looking at it for a cure for the whole world because this is a world cure, not just the United States. We want to take care of the United States, but uh, whatever we do is going to inure to the benefit of the world, so we want to do that. And uh, fortunately, your, some of your companies are so large you can, you can handle that, but you work together, thereby making it even better. So we appreciate that. We would love to have you work together on this, get it done, and get it done safely and quickly. Uh, but I think uh, I we're in very strong shape, very strong shape financially. And, and, you know, I have to tell you, I came into the room not expecting to hear quite what I've heard, uh, but a lot of work has already been done. We've been encouraging them for the last few weeks. I mean, literally from the first day when we shut it down, when we shut down the border, so to speak, uh, we shut it down to China, something we didn't like to do, but we made a good decision. Uh, but we also called some of the companies around the table and said, get going just in case, get going. And uh, we're very proud of the work that some of them have done. Some are very advanced already on this particular coronavirus. 
So we appreciate it. That's tremendous news. And I think the speed is a lot greater than a lot of people would have thought. Yeah. Do you see a need for federal dollars to go to some of these drug companies? I think two of the CEOs around the table mentioned the idea. They're so rich. I know the companies very well. Some of them are so rich, I think uh, they can actually loan money to the federal government. <laughs> They don't need money. They need time. I think what they need more than anything else, Danny, you might tell me, but I think what you need is uh, FDA and uh, Tony have to help you get through the process uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, the bureaucratic stuff, and, and we don't have bureaucrats here. We have people that really know how to get it done. I mean, Tony and Bob and uh, Stephen, uh, they'll get you folks through very, very quickly. Exactly. So speaking, of the, speaking of the Fed, Mr. President, um, do you think that they should hold an emergency meeting before the meeting in a couple of weeks to cut rates and has your, is your administration? Well, I think they should have had a meeting already. So, you know, I think they should have, and the central banks are gonna be talking about various things tomorrow, uh, but we'll see what happens. But I think they should have had a meeting already. I don't know what takes them so long. Will you ask them to? Will you ask them to? Uh, I'll see what happens. Let's see what happens tomorrow. What do you Americans buying out all the hand sanitizers? They're buying what? Buying out all the hand sanitizers. So the strong time about a long-term situation here. Listen, as the president has said, we've said uh, from the outset, we're going to see more cases here in the United States, and we need to be prepared. We need to be, we prepare for the worst case, we hope for the best case. Part of preparing is normal preparedness activities by individuals. Go to cdc.gov to get information about just sound preparedness at home, like you would have for a hurricane or for the flu season. That's the same type of activity now. So having some food, having some hand sanitizer, but frankly, soap and water, a good, a good soap and water hand washing um, for an appropriate amount of time, if you look at cdc.gov for guidance, is as effective as that kind of sanitizer. But people should not be panicked. They shouldn't be. I know they may feel that. They may feel a sense of unease. They feel the uncertainty. And we're trying to reveal all information we have. Um, but there are steps people could take like that, just good everyday preparedness. Nothing different today than they, I would have advised six months ago to people. Mr. President, are you considering tightening any of the travel regulations? Yes, we are uh, to certain countries where they have more of a breakout. We are. Uh, you know what those countries are, I don't have to say, but uh, we are doing that. And we've already done it, as you know, with three countries in addition to China. So uh, we will be doing that. Mr. President. You said the supplemental is here. What's the price tag up to? And are, are you also considering a national emergency declaration that would allow states and local governments to be I don't think you'll need that because I really think we're in you know, extremely good shape. Uh, we're prepared for anything, and we could always do that at a later date if we need it, but I don't think we need that at this stage. You know, interestingly, we were discussing, and a question I get asked a lot by people is, uh, on average, you lose from 26,000 to 70,000 or so, and even in some cases more from the flu. We, lose, we have deaths of that per year uh, worldwide. It's hundreds of thousands of deaths from the common flu. And they ask, you know, what's the difference and how does this uh, differ? And I guess there are things that are similar and things that are different. Every one of them is different. Uh, it might not be a bad question to ask because I get that all the time. Uh, so, so far, we have six here. You have in other countries very, I mean, China obviously got hit the hardest. Uh, I noticed that South Korea is hit very hard. Italy is being hit very hard. Uh, but I, I would like to maybe know, because I, I have oftentimes asked, we average, I suspect, uh, Tony, I think you said from around 26, 27,000 up to 60 or 70,000 deaths per year. That's a lot of deaths. And uh, here we're talking about a much smaller range. Now, hopefully, it stays at a much smaller range. And again, we're prepared for anything. Uh, could I ask you, uh, or any of you, if you'd like to answer that question, where would the public, what would the public think when you have so many? And that's taken routinely. And I was shocked to hear this. You know, three, four weeks ago, I said, well, how many people die a year from the flu out of this country? I think last year was 36 or 37,000 people. And I'm saying, wow, nobody knew that information. Worldwide, you just multiply it out times the world, right? Uh, so what is the difference, Dave? Well, I think there are people around the table that probably are more medically qualified, but I mean, uh, clearly what we represent around the table is the ability to prevent, uh, you know, uh, a, uh, uh, you know, an endemic of sorts 
and the ability to treat. And those two things going together, I think, are really, really important as investors. Eric's presented. So we have to up our research on the flu. Well, yeah, right. And we do have treatments for the flu, and we have vaccinations for the flu, and, and we need to continue to improve upon those. But, uh, Doctor? Yeah, we've actually taken on the challenge that you uh, just mentioned. So we are investing in what could be new technology to completely change the outcome of flu. And you need to think about how you can move fast from the first cases to have the right type of vaccine, and how you can be able to manufacture it very fast. Because I, I think you are right on to point that the numbers in flu are so large and we haven't come that, to that level yet. But I think it's also the fear that there is no experience yet with this virus. And we don't have uh, the feeling of going to CVS and get the flu vaccine or use some of the early developed drugs. But I, I think you summarized it very well. These are challenges we should take on year by year in advance uh, and protect lives. President. Including, including uh, Tony, that you have to maybe we have to step up our work on the flu because when you lose that many people, yeah, Mr. President, what we're doing is that we have a major effort to develop what we call a universal flu vaccine, right? Namely, a vaccine that you can give that will cover all the different strains, so you don't have to keep worrying about it mutating from year to year. That's fantastic. Yeah. So that's a major effort that we're having. Because I notice every year they say a different vaccine, they have a little different little. And then, you know, I hear numbers that are not great, 60%, 70% coverage, success. And yet I hear numbers that are better than that with respect to corona. You think you can really knock it out. And that's because you know specifically what it is, I suspect. So that's impressive. What do you think, Lenny? I think one thing we can be sure, we're going to be surprised <laughs> about what happens over the next couple of months. And we got to be prepared as you're trying to do for every surprise that'll come at us. Because remember, maybe 100 million people, I was just checking, get vaccinated for the flu, even if there's 60% protection. We have nobody in this country vaccinated for coronavirus right now. So that, if it goes through the public- The same vaccine could not work. You take a, a solid flu vaccine, you don't think that would have an impact or much of an impact on corona? No. Probably none. Uh, probably none. none. So, so, that's why you have a difference when you have a, a population that is totally naked to this virus. Yeah. We, that's why a vaccine approach, getting that as quickly as we can, of course, is, is paramount. And the other thing is we, we have a group of people around this table, myself included, who are, in who are in an industry where optimism is an essential part of the toolkit. But realism is that, you know, 95% of what we all work on doesn't go too far. So we, that's why it's so important to have so many different approaches. We can't pick it the- It seems to me, way. just based on what you said and also what the other folks said from great companies, companies I know very well from just seeing you know what they do, and I find it very interesting. I have for a long time. It would seem to me that uh, you already know pretty much where you're going and where you're headed and what the answer is gonna be. It would seem that, Steve, doesn't it seem? You seem to know what the answer is to this. You have to get it done. Or is that too optimistic a statement? I think some of the new technologies that have come. We heard today a little bit about uh, mRNA and DNA, where you use completely new right. tools and technologies. They give us an opportunity to move fast. And that's why some of the companies that have been working on other diseases can quickly sh uh, change priorities and meet a huge public health threat. But I, I think we should take on as a team to do something with the uh, seasonal flu and actually I think, Robert Redfield, that has been one of your key priorities, and we have certainly picked up on that. By the way, that would be a great thing if you could do that, just aside from this meeting. If you could do that, that would be a great thing. Does anybody else have anything to say, please? Well, I want to just thank you all very much for being here, and it sound, I'm very, it's a very optimistic meeting. I didn't realize you were that far advanced, and you'll get together if you have to. You'll deal with Tony and Bob, and you'll deal with uh, Stephen, and, uh, Get it done. We need it. We want it fast. Okay? I don't know what the time will be. I don't think they know what the time will be. I've heard very quick numbers, a matter of months, and I've heard pretty much a year would be an outside number. So I think that's not a bad that's not a bad range. But if you're talking about three to four months in a couple of cases and a year in other cases. Uh, wouldn't you say, Doctor, would that be about right? Is it realistic to think, really, that a vaccine is 
Well, you have the greatest companies in the world sitting around the table. I mean, Johnson & Johnson and Pfizer and all of the companies, Gilead, uh, you have all of these great companies, and that's what they're saying. So I think that... Uh, I think you make sure you get the president the information that a vaccine that you make and start testing a year is not a vaccine that's deployable. So he's asking the question, when is it going to be deployable? And that is going to be at the earliest a year to a year and a half, no matter how fast you go. You think that's right? And as you said, the treatments so have to be available before yeah, the vaccine. Before vaccine. So that's why you well, have to. I think treatments, in many ways, might be more exciting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. that's, and that's what I think, and that's what I think Ambassador, Ambassador Burks, I think, laid out a really nice framework as we think about managing expectations, which is be thinking antiviral therapeutics, transitioning to monoclonal antibodies, and eventually to vaccines as we think about the continuum of research and development here. Is that fair for yeah, CEOs? Yeah, yeah. Gordon, yeah. Well, you know, I think, Tony, I think that's interesting because the concept of treatment in a certain way, especially when you have people that are, that are looking for treatment, they've already got, they're, they're beyond the vaccine stage. That would be very exciting. And it always goes faster than vaccine because yeah. you're dealing with someone yeah. who's already sick. That's so right. the safety issues are going to be much, much different. And you will know your result almost immediately, whereas with vaccines, it takes so, so then, what would be your timing for treatment? Therapeutics, commonly known as well, I call it treatment. Yeah, what would be your number for, for, for us? We can think about producing 20,000 doses by the end of the summer of a tr course of treatment. Um, and as uh, Dr. Fauci said, you're going to find out very quickly. It's not going to be a mystery whether these things work or not. We're pretty confident that a mon our, ours is the monoclonal antibody approach. We think that that approach has a very high probability in the near term of delivery. Uh, so, so, uh, so be... treatment, I mean, just for the media, so the treatment element of it goes faster than the vaccine element of it, which, in my opinion, in this case, would be better. Go ahead, please. Sir. But, I mean, the remdesivir, our medicine, is in phase three trials right now. And these trials are conducted very fast. I mean, we're talking about 30-day endpoints. Yes. So you recruit them, you know in 30 days, you know, once you recruit whether it works or not. Thankfully, so far, the drug seems to be very safe. What we have to determine is its level of, of efficacy, its clinical effectiveness. Uh, and that, as I said, we'll know potentially so as early as they... as a treatment. Somebody is sick, they have the problem, I'm Tony. Lying. It yes. could be used. When do you think it could be used? Well, if the, if the trial that, that Daniel was talking about proves efficacy, which you likely might know in a few months whether it's effective yes. or not. Yes. If you know by June yes. that it's effective, then you just scale up and manufacture it and you're good to go. How good is that? Hear that, Jeff? That's good even by your standpoint, well, let me, Jeff. Let me give you an example, for instance, with, with the Regeneron product with Ebola. So Tony Fauci and his team uh, and the World Health Organization ran a historic forearm clinical trial in the war zone in Eastern Congo. And two of the products, one of them developed by NIAID, and one of them developed by Regeneron, Regeneron <clears throat> proved so effective that the ethical board said stop on the other two. I'm sorry, Dan. <laughs> one of them was yours. Um, one of them was said, <laughs> said, <laughs> one of them didn't work there. They said, and start treating. And when I went to the Congo, I got to see people that even before FDA approval are being treated still in the extension of this clinical yeah, trial and being cured of Ebola now, walking out where they would have had a death sentence before. We just that's, what, that's what we would try so to do. for us, that's an end of the summer type of an event. That's what we would try to do. He just got back from the Congo. And uh, that's know, dedication. Uh, he was, that was not an easy trip, was it? Yeah. I mean, it wasn't easy to get that trial there, by the way. Kudos. Heroes, heroes. Well, I want to thank everybody in this room. Mike, go ahead. Yeah, just, uh, I was about to do the same as President. Just Two of the products, one of them developed by NIAID, one of them developed by the Regeneron, <clears throat> proved so effective that the ethical board said stop on the other two. I'm sorry, Dan. One of them was yours. Um, <laughs> said, <laughs> said, <laughs> said, <laughs> they said, and start treating. And when I went to the Congo, I got to see people that even before FDA approval are being treated still in the extension of this. Everybody in this room, Mike, go ahead. Yeah, just, I, I was about to do the same as President, just pledged that our our whole task force, this whole team, HHS, I know CDC, President and I will be at NIH tomorrow. Look forward to working with all of you. And I wanna, I wanna commend each and every one of you for responding to the President's call for action. This is all hands on deck. 
and the news out of this meeting that you've already formed a consortium. We know we have the greatest pharmaceutical industry in the world in the United States, Mr. President. Now we know they will be working together to create therapeutics and ultimately a new vaccine to deal That's with the coronavirus, and I want to thank you all. And anybody delays you, please call me. <laughs> they don't just call Tony and Bob. Huh? Thanks. All right. Call Alex. They must have heard about this meeting. <laughs> who's, who's talking outside? <laughs> now, this is a very optimistic meeting. Look, I know optimism and not optimism and pessimism, the worst pessimism, and I will tell you, uh, the whole thing with therapeutics to me is very exciting, and obviously vaccine, but therapeutics is very exciting, especially when you're so far advanced. That's great. That's really great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Say hello to everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Good. They heard what happened at this meeting. It's up seven. It's up 13. There was a Come on, that's a good show. So. Come on. Let's go, Preston. Come on, guys. What a great meeting. Thank you.